Hi, this is Junaid with Acute Ischemic Stroke 2019 Guidelines Review Series. In this, we're going to continue with the prior lecture and discuss pre-hospital systems. And this time, we're going to also concentrate on telestroke. I'm really grateful for VMET for putting this education series and supporting me to produce this for everyone and not just their clients. Now we come to the telemedicine portion. So telemedicine is actually one of those things that people have actually debated that does it really improve care? So let me, let me clarify what that means. Telemedicine is definitely beneficial to improve coverage. There are, there are no neurologists available at some hospitals and they won't be available for some hospitals. And even if they're available, they're actually covering two, three, four different hospitals. At the end of the day, one physician cannot respond to uh, so many stroke calls. So at the end of the day, the biggest benefit of telemedicine is you can get the specialist on the bedside within three to five minutes. And that helps tremendously for coverage issues. At the end of the day, is there someone that you, could, can, you can argue that the eligibility requirement changes or anything? We can. So let's go step by step. Teleradiology, of course, if it's FDA approved, it helps. Clearly, their level of evidence is fantastic. There's a five minute read, official read is up in the system with teleradiology much faster than local people. And that's unfortunately the way the world is. Uh, the second thing is support rapid imaging interpretation. Again, these are things that if the telemedicine is implemented and teleradiology is implemented, it helps a lot. The third thing is use of telemedicine and telestroke resources and systems should be supported. And this is where the key thing is. The level of evidence, if you look at it, it's expert opinion. And that's, unfortunately, experts might have biases, including me. I have a big bias. But here's the class of recommendation. The class of recommendation says one, because we have noted and when we are stroke directors and we are actually talking to different hospital systems around the world, around the world, by the way, I do. And the idea is that if you look at it, the biggest issue comes in is basically the proper specialist available with proper expertise at the time. And unfortunately, it's not there. And if you look at it, that's why we say that there should be proper support for telemedicine platforms in terms of peers, you know, institutions, governments, etc. However, you may not use it. You should not use it in terms, if you have a local program that can support it, please don't use the telemedicine. I don't think so that telemedicine surpasses uh, in-house, period. I don't think so. We don't, we never said that. What it does is that if you don't have a coverage, it is so much better than no coverage, right? Or delayed coverage. Actually, in my opinion, delayed coverage is worse because at the end of the day, that's actually much more harmful for the institution and the patient. It opens up a whole slew of liabilities because if you have no coverage, you can say transfer the patient. But if you have delayed coverage, that's actually even worse. So telemedicine should be supported and should be you know, uh, supported in, in policy making, peer support, whatever that means. And there's clearly class of recommendation to support it. However, does it improve the eligibility of decision making? Um, the level of evidence is not is there. By the way, it's not like zero. It definitely does improve a little bit in the eligibility criteria, especially in ruling out, not ruling it. Um, because when you get a call from ER and the patient says, oh, you know, this patient is clearly stroke, at that point in time, you know, yeah, there's a facial proof with the right upper extremity lever extremity weakness. Doesn't require a rocket science. But in those situations where the patient comes in, the ER physician says, hey, the patient is actually aphasic, and you actually go in and say, no, this is not aphasia. This is actually altered mental status confusion. Don't give TPA. That's where really the telestroke comes. And that's where the money is, to be honest with you. Because if you stop one TPA appropriately, or if you stop one transfer, it pays for the whole telemedicine part, believe me or not. So that literally, there's a huge difference in, in these situations. Is it beneficial uh, to guide telestroke IV TPA? It could be. And, I, and for me, I've been practicing telemedicine 50% of the time, and I think that it does provide a lot of value. And two senses uh, from, from purely, as I said, in my opinion, we are better, when you are looking through the video camera and eligibility of that patient, and also you're actually more important in looking at if the patient actually will benefit from the TPA because most of the time we are faster at it. Also, it is great for the ER physicians, the ER nurses, and especially the family members at bedside. It's so, even if I'm giving them a bad news, like a massive bleed in the brain or a large vessel occlusion, they're actually so thankful that we got there right away. We looked at the CAT scan and gave them the information. And I think just that, if I knew that from my family member, that would be much more helpful and that would be so much better. Um, is the telephone consultation feasible and safe? Um, it is feasible. Uh, 
Of course, it's better than no coverage, but if you should have a proper telemedicine platform for telestroke, in my opinion, it should be live video, live audio and video based. So there is no official sort of teleneurology targets that have been assessed. And, and I have, I'm going to look, and there's going to be another series on American Telemedicine Association guidelines for acute telestroke care. But generally speaking, if you're the stroke director or a stroke physician who's partly covering or, you know, or you're covering a rural area, and if one of your CMOs asked you, hey, what should we demand from a teleneurology company, this is what you should demand. Stroke alert within five minutes, basic clinical trial consultation by phone right away, and then, you know, initiate telestroke protocol, and they can say this is going to be direct to CT, this is going to be direct to CTA, etc. and PPA decision should be within 30 minutes, because that's, again, the idea behind it is if you're paying for the party, then get the benefits. And this is something that we actually instill in VMED as well. Our response time is now three minutes. And then more importantly, of course, that not only you're doing the TPA decision making, you're also putting in the consult mode within as soon as possible. And the idea behind it, if the patient is getting transferred, if the patient is moving to another facility, the, the, the actual documentation goes with the patient as soon as possible. Of course, we do verbal confirmations as well, but at the end of the day, it's better to be written and then available as well. Establishment of uh, data repositories is very important as well. There should be a way that you have, and this is actually part of the Comprehensive Stroke Center, at least get with the guidelines, we, we collect all this data. And that is extremely important. When we say we collect this, it's very important that physicians should not be responsible. We're not data collectors. There should be a way that these data is collected either automatically through the EMR systems or then the person who's data collecting it. And more importantly, as I said, and the next one is that there should be a multidisciplinary quality improvement committee, and that is class one recommendation. Because if you have, if you're going to just collect the data and not do anything about it, then why are you collecting the data? I mean, it's sitting dust over there. That's why I kept saying that real time feedback is extremely important in these situations as well. And then as soon as you collect the data, there's a committee that says, that looks at the data, that finds what the disparities are, that finds where the gaps are, and those gaps, you actually act on it and then improve the quality of care in your particular institute. And then uh, stroke outcome measures should not should be included in that. So adjustment, for example, if there is a severity that the patient has, there should be adjusted for it. But at the end of the day, it should not just include the data of the TPA given in 30 minutes. What happened to the patient? If you do not have stroke outcome measures that are included in it, then you can't really identify what you did right and what you did wrong. Okay. And this continuous quality improvement uh, element of stroke care and system as a whole. And then at the end of the day, uh, we should be able to identify and compare some of these processes at different hospital systems. And that should actually impact public policy and that hospitals should compete. This is America. We should actually have this sort of true competition on terms of data and outcomes uh, if possible. Again, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for your time. Please like, subscribe, and share. Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter.